Hi, and welcome to episode 75 of Tote Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott, the editor at TokeSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. First, let's look at our Tote Signals Bud Pick of the Week. We have an interestingly named Indica here. It's called 911 Bin Laden, and it's from Little Green Remedies in Port Orchard, Washington. Let's do the news now, shall we? In the United States this week, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration study concludes marijuana doesn't increase car crashes. This new study from NHTSA has concluded that smoking marijuana before driving doesn't make you more likely to get into a car crash, especially when compared to drinking before driving. This study looked at 9,000 drivers over the past year to examine the impact of cannabis on driving. Now, although one quarter of marijuana users were more likely to be involved in a car crash than people who did not tote, once the gender, age, and race ethnicity of the cannabis users were considered, it turned out that these differences actually contributed more to crash risk than marijuana. Younger drivers crashed more than older ones, and men had more crashes than women. Drivers who consumed alcohol, of course, were clearly more likely to crash. Those with a 0.08% breath alcohol level crashed four times more than sober drivers. And drivers with a level of 0.15% were 12 times more likely to crash. Testing positive for marijuana was defined in this study as having delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, in the system. However, marijuana does affect drivers' senses, according to the study, and the number of drivers with THC in their systems is on the rise. Drivers should never get behind the wheel impaired, and we know that marijuana impairs judgment, reaction times, and awareness, claimed Jeff Michael, director of the Office of Impaired Driving and Occupant Protection. Sensationalistic media reports, and those who support the per se 5 nanogram per milliliter blood THC cutoff points for impaired driving, which is part of the marijuana legalization law in Washington state, have hyped the idea that drugged driving would wreak havoc on the roadways now that cannabis is more accepted. But highway fatalities have reached near record lows since Colorado legalized marijuana and have also gone down in medical marijuana states. Also in the U.S. this week, a recovering alcoholic was confirmed as drug czar and he takes the top spot at the ONDCP. President Obama's nominee for director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy, acting director Michael Botticelli, was confirmed by the Senate 92 to nothing on Monday granting him one of the nation's highest drug control offices. A recovering alcoholic with extensive career experience in public health, the new drug czar, as he's informally known, has potential to take more of a public health approach than did his predecessors, including former Seattle Police Chief Gil Kurlikowski, the most recent office holder, who was confirmed as Commissioner of U.S. Customs and Border Protection last March. Botticelli has recently said that Congress shouldn't interfere with the will of D.C. voters to legalize marijuana, despite the ONDCP's official stance on legalization. Last week, he was quoted in a conference call saying that the ONDCP will bar federal funding from drug courts that prevent access to medication-assisted treatment for opiate addiction. Appointing someone who personally understands addiction provides hope that the government is taking a stronger public health approach to drug policy said Major Neil Franklin, retired executive director of law enforcement against prohibition. Botticelli understands that it doesn't make sense to treat drug users as criminals because imprisonment has never proven to be effective at reducing abuse. Botticelli was arrested for drunk driving in 1988 and worked towards sobriety thereafter. He then dedicated his career to helping others recover. He joined the Massachusetts Department of Health and eventually served as director of substance abuse services from 2003 to 2012. As director, he oversaw a program in Quincy that gave police access to naloxone, a drug that saves lives by safely reversing opiate overdoses. His career is celebrated as one that prioritizes public health and safety for those who battle addiction by instituting humane, effective, and compassionate policies and programs. In California this week, we have a legislator introducing a bill to end organ transplant denials for medical marijuana patients. Americans for Safe Access is sponsoring this bill introduced by Mark Levine, a Democrat from San Rafael, to end this discriminatory practice. California State Assembly member Mark Levine has introduced AB 258, the Medical Cannabis Organ Transplant Act, a bill aimed at preventing medical marijuana patients from being unduly denied organ transplants. The Medical Cannabis Organ Transplant Act is sponsored by Americans for Safe Access, which has long advocated for patients seeking organ transplants including a patient named Norman B. Smith, 
he was a medical marijuana patient who died in 2012 after being denied a liver transplant at Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Specifically, AB 258 states that a hospital, physician, and surgeon, procurement organization, or other person shall not determine the ultimate recipient of an anatomical gift based solely upon a potential recipient status as a qualified patient or based solely on a positive test for the use of medical marijuana by a potential recipient who is a qualified patient. The bill simply establishes the same protections that currently exist for other transplant candidates with mental or physical disabilities. Arcane public health policies view medical cannabis patients as drug abusers, said Assembly Member Levine in a prepared statement. Too often, patients are denied a life-saving organ transplant solely because they are prescribed medical cannabis. These patients have died after being dropped from the list, and many more are in jeopardy right now, Levine said. This legislation will save lives by ensuring medical cannabis patients are not discriminated against in the organ transplant process. The bill's introduction comes less than two months after the California Medical Association adopted a resolution stating that medical marijuana should not be used as a criterion for denying organ transplants. Laws already exist in Arizona, Delaware, Illinois, Minnesota, New Hampshire, and Washington state that explicitly protect qualified patients from discrimination when seeking organ transplants. Now, according to ASA, several patients have reported being denied organ transplants in California over the past few years, including patients at UCLA Medical Center, Stanford Medical School, UCSF Medical Center, and Cedars Sinai. Most transplant centers will disqualify patients from receiving organ transplants or refuse to place them on a waiting list unless they test negative for marijuana for six months and take drug abuse counseling for the same period of time. Norman Smith was attempting to comply with Cedar Sinai's policy when he died. Without national guidelines, transplant centers like those in California are left to design their own policies, most of which discriminate against medical marijuana patients, according to advocates. Medical centers have also refused to change their policies despite being urged to do so in the cases of Smith and of Tony Trapillo, another Cedar Sinai patient seeking a kidney transplant. After being on a waiting list for six years, Cedar Sinai delisted de Trujillo because her medical marijuana use was considered substance abuse. Denying organ transplants to otherwise eligible medical marijuana patients is the worst kind of discrimination, said ASA California Director Don Duncan. The Medical Cannabis Organ Transplant Act will stop legal patients in California from being denied organ transplants and will bring the state's policies up to date with a growing body of scientific evidence. It's time to change these punitive policies, and we look forward to working with the legislature to get that done, Duncan said. In Washington State this week, one small town plans to run its own marijuana store by month's end. The city of North Bonneville, Washington, a community of about a thousand residents on the Columbia River, doesn't appear extraordinary at first glance, but it's unique in one way. It's about to become the first municipality in Washington State to run its own marijuana store. The city's just weeks from getting a license to open the store, which local officials said could serve as a model for other cities across the state. North Bonneville was founded on the timber industry, which is now in steep decline, so it counts on tourism as a major economic force. The city is just 45 miles northeast of Portland, Oregon, another state which recently legalized recreational cannabis. But city leaders in North Bonneville said tourism wasn't the driving force behind their decision to open a marijuana store. North Bonneville Mayor Don Stevens said the city wanted to seize control of its own destiny in the evolution of a legal cannabis market that holds great promise, even while pockets of hardcore opposition to pot continue to exist. I view North Bonneville's approach as the city being welcoming to the whole idea of recreational marijuana legalization and trying to ensure it's done as cleanly and professionally and with as much of an eye on the public health and welfare as possible, Mayor Stevens said. The financial aspects of it are certainly part of the equation, but they weren't the primary factor. Now, the city is setting up an entity called a Public Development Authority, which will own and oversee the cannabis store, while also shielding the municipality from legal and financial liabilities. But the PDA's board of directors must be approved by the North Bonneville City Council and its charter, and thus the marijuana store itself can be dissolved by the city at any time if local leaders decide that's necessary. If someone else had come in and got a license and shortly after started getting busted for selling to teenagers out the back door or doing anything in violation of the law, our only avenue of correcting that would be to contact law enforcement and have them increase patrols and try to catch people in the act, Mayor Stevens said. Whereas with the PDA, if we were to see something going on that we didn't think was right, 
We could just put it on the agenda for the next city council meeting and vote them out of existence, and they're done. About 40% of Washington's cities and towns, mostly in rural parts of the state, have instituted bans or moratoriums on legal marijuana shops, despite the 2012 passage of I-502, a statewide referendum legalizing cannabis by a majority of voters. We wanted confidence that we would have a marijuana retail establishment in here that was run by an organization that was really interested in doing the right things for the community, Mayor Stevens said. We felt by setting up a PDA to operate the store, we were taking the bull by the horns instead of just crossing our fingers and hoping we would get a good, reputable business. Instead of someone who might be more focused on the bottom line at all costs and might be willing to cut corners and do things that weren't appropriate. As far as we know, we're the only PDA created and organized to run a recreational cannabis store, Stevens said, and we see a lot of pressure to do it right and make it be successful and start the ball rolling for everyone. I think there's a really good chance that you're going to see more cities try and do this in the future because it just makes sense on so many levels. Brian Smith, spokesman for the Washington State Liquor Control Board, confirmed that the North Bonneville Cannabis Store is near the end of the licensing process and, quote, is the closest one in the county to getting a license. North Bonneville is located along Washington's southern border in Skamania County, which is authorized under I-502 rules to receive two retail marijuana licenses. Smith of the LCB confirmed that North Bonneville's approach to the marijuana market is one of a kind, adding that once the license is issued, the city would be home to the first municipally operated pot store in the state. Also in Washington state this week, a federal judge plans to hear a motion to dismiss in the Kettle Falls 5 medical marijuana case. Defendant Larry Harvey will argue that new con a new congressional measure forbids the Department of Justice from prosecuting his family. This motion to dismiss will be heard in federal court Thursday in a widely watched medical marijuana case involving a family from rural northeastern Washington state. Larry Harvey, 71, and other family members of the so-called Kettle Falls Five have moved for dismissal of their case, arguing that a recently enacted congressional measure forbids the Department of Justice from prosecuting them. Prosecuting persons who may be operating in compliance with state medical marijuana laws prevent states from implementing their own laws, reads one of the motions to dismiss written by Harvey's attorney, Robert Fisher. Harvey's motion argues that state law is undermined by discouraging lawful patients from accessing medical marijuana because of the threat of federal prosecution. Harvey also argues that federal prosecutors take away Washington's authority to determine for itself whether someone is in compliance with its laws or not. Harvey's motion to dismiss comes just two months after President Obama signed the so-called Promnibus Spending Bill, which included Section 538 an historic writer that prohibits DOJ funds from being spent to block implementation of state medical marijuana laws. Advocates argue that federal prosecutions like that of the Kettle Falls Five run contrary to the spirit and letter of the law, now in effect. Now, Kettle Falls Five is made up of mostly family members, including Harvey, his wife Rhonda Firestack Harvey, 56, her son Roland Gregg, 33, daughter-in-law Michelle Gregg, 36, and friend of the family Jason Zucker, 39. Larry and Rhonda are retired and have a home in rural Washington State near the town of Kettle Falls. All five defendants are legal patients with serious medical conditions, including Larry, who was recently diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer, which has metastasized to his liver. Back in August 2012, the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration raided the property and seized 44 premature marijuana plants, charging the five with conspiracy to manufacture and maintaining a drug-involved premises and possession of firearm in the furtherance of a drug trafficking crime. Federal agents also confiscated the family's 2007 Saturn, $700 in cash, their legally owned firearms, and other personal property. Each defendant faces a mandatory minimum of 10 years in prison. In the United States this week, more than 100 Native American tribes considered growing and selling marijuana. More than 100 tribes have reportedly contacted Foxberry Farms, a company which says it is building the nation's first marijuana cultivation facility on tribal land over the past month, expressing interest in the cannabis industry. There's been a surge of interest since the Federal Department of Justice's announcement late last year that tribes are free to grow and sell marijuana on their lands, as long as they follow specific guidelines. I really underestimated, said Foxberry CEO Barry Brockman, whose company also works with tribes to build and operate casinos. So many tribes are wanting to do this right now. Foxbury and the Denver-based United Cannabis Corporation recently signed a contract to construct a huge medical marijuana farm on the Pinole Bill Pomo Nations Ranch in Northern California. 
The two and a half acre, $10 million installation will cultivate, process, and sell marijuana under the United Cannabis brand, according to Brotman, who said the operation would employ 50 to 100 people with preference to tribe members. Tribes across the country could experience an economic boom, according to Brotman, who's also negotiating with three other California-based tribes, as well as groups in seven other states. Tribes want what any government wants for its people, and that's financial independence, Brotman said. They want to earn their own money, provide education, health care, and housing. This new industry allows them to be more economically independent. Now, a Department of Justice memorandum issued in December states that Native American tribes are free to grow and sell marijuana as long as they adhere to the same federal guidelines that govern, govern state legal medical and recreational marijuana. We did our research and found that the federal government defers to local jurisdictions on how they're going to deal with marijuana, Brotman said. By the definition of sovereign territories, tribal reservations are exactly the same as local jurisdictions. Chad Ruby, the CEO of United Cannabis, told the Huffington Post that dozens of tribes have contacted him as well. This is just the start of our business model, Ruby said. It is absolutely our plan to team up with tribes all over the country. And our final story tonight. Police raid an Illinois family over a suspected meth lab, and it was maple syrup. Overzealous law enforcement agents continued to take the war on drugs to what we'd call a deeply silly level if it didn't so easily and so often result in tragic consequences. A family in Union County, Illinois, found themselves in a sticky situation, staring down the business end of a SWAT team's machine guns after cops mistook their maple syrup for a meth lab. The raid happened last week when heavily armed drug agents swarmed the home armed with military-grade weapons and a warrant based on nothing more than the speculation of bored, nosy neighbors. I heard the dogs barking, said Laura Benson, and I knew that meant somebody was outside the house. And I looked out the windows, and I seen a truck coming up the driveway fairly fast, and a police car right behind it. Laura figured her son might be in trouble, because she was sure she hadn't done anything to justify an armed raid. They had a report of a meth lab going on on our property, she said, and they wanted to investigate it. They pointed to the buckets, and I told them my husband has a hobby of making maple syrup, Laura said. Of course, they realized it once they seen it, but I was quite startled this morning. I think my neighbors on their way to church see the buckets and stuff and think we've got a meth lab operation going on here, Laura said. I just want to put their minds at ease and let them know it's maple syrup and that they're all welcome for pancakes if they want to come over, she added with a laugh. See you next week. Until then, stay lifted.